principles. Now I'm very happy to uh, introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Hans-Peter Lippe, now Professor Emeritus at Institute of Evolutionary Medicine at the University of Zurich, but for a long, long time, Professor of Anatomy in the same university and uh, with a long time interest in comparative and functional anatomy, natural genetics, uh, uh, natural genetic variation of hippocampal uh, structures and how uh, this is related to behavior. Hans Petter has been a founding member of International Be uh, Behavior and Neural Genetics Society from uh, 1996. And uh, he has been awarded as uh, uh, IBANK's distinguished investigator in 2009 and also nominated as an IBANKS Fellow in 2019 for scientific excellence uh, and support uh, of the society through service on committees and continued uh, uh, membership for, for many years. Uh, in 1990s, uh, due to the, his, uh, his interest in, in mice and other rodents, uh, uh, the laboratory in Zurich was probably one of the most advanced uh, uh, mouse behavioral laboratories. Um, and, and therefore had a central place in, in characterizing many, uh, many, many mutant mice uh, all over the Europe. And uh, important contribution by Hans Peter was also uh, establishing uh, several EMBO fence uh, uh, founded courses on characterizing mutant mice um, together with Richard Morris and David Wolfer. And I had a, a privilege to participate one, uh, on one of them and also uh, several courses on ecological brain research in Russian field station. And uh, today Hans Peter promised uh, to uh, take us uh, back to the roots of uh, IntelliCage and uh, not only IntelliCage, but uh, automated uh, monitoring of, uh, of laboratory animals um, in their uh, natural settings and laboratories. So we are very happy to have you here, Hans-Peter, please. The screen is yours. Okay, thank you. Hopefully we start. When you see the start screen, then you <laughs> see that I always had two interests. One it's, is, it's not yet, Hans-Peter, it's not shared yet. It's not shared yet. Right. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so fine. So basically I was always interested in general biology of behavior, but also in the way how the brain works in a translational sense. I wanted to know what's going on between my ears. And so I relatively quickly left the field of anthropology and for a PhD thesis, we now jump back very much in time. I started with neuroetology of marmosets and I will spend some time with that. Afterwards, to have a quick look how the mossy fiber study began and why whiskers are important for mice. Then we had up the building of a phenotyping lab where we encountered the usual problems. Then we moved to Russia how to check what can be checked outdoors, came back to the lab. And when there is enough time, I hope that I can offer you some conclusions and ideas to think about. Now, this is a very historic picture. 50 years ago, 1972, the first home cage stimulation of marmosets in social settings. You see, there was electric current going to the monkey here. I was sitting three level upstairs and it was basically a crazy idea to have a PhD candidate without technical knowledge starting such a stuff. But in the end, I succeeded fortunately. And I show you here, what happens when you take the monkey out, put it in kind of a box, you stimulate it and you find that he becomes very aggressive. The electrode locations were around 
a, a nucleus called the ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus. And this is quite a behavioral powerhouse. Look at that. There are two electrodes, there were two electrode locations nearby. The monkey was sitting calmly here. When this electrode inside the nucleus, just in the shell, was stimulated, he would slash his cage mate. The one he escapes. Five minutes later, the stimulation here. The monkey is no longer aggressive, but quickly runs the heights in the box. And the advantage of working with marmosets was then and up today that you can easily recognize their behavior. They are very extroverted and you know exactly what this guy is feeling and what he's doing and what happens here. The idea, there is often the idea that hypothalamic stimulation elicits some robot-like behavior, which is not at all true. This is a, a quite interesting part of the study. You see that the camera here was, was only recorded by camera. I was not present. And, <coughs> and so the monkeys were not disturbed. When stimulation started, there was first arousal, and then the slash against the cage mate who escaped. And afterwards, the monkey made this arch back and started chattering, so ke -ke -ke -ke, a vocal threat. And after stopping the stimulation, he was looking around for a while. But then if I came with the glove into the room, he immediately hid it in the box. When stimulation started, he climbed out, what he never did before, stared at me, you see the ruffled tail, and started a completely different behavior, which is called mobbing. And this is a sharp tick, 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 tick. Usually they use this behavior when they sit on the trees and look to a predator passing by. So, the message of that slide is that the hypothalamus controls the species specific behavior in a very precise way and adapts it to the environment. So it's not a robot like <coughs> event or the stimulation is not robot like, but really can evoke the complete gem of species specific behaviors in the rostral brainstem. When I finished or had finished the thesis, I uh, compensated the number of animals I used, reading them at home, keeping them even sometimes in the office. And I can tell you, it's a good way to keep colleagues out and to have the office for use yourself, because that's the disadvantage of Marmoset they stink somewhat. And by the way, when I stopped a couple of years of reading, but nowadays, unfortunately, they sell for 6,000 euro a piece and you will learn, we will learn later why this is so. But there was then a stage at the ETH, the home institute now of David. And I tried first so brain stimulation and I saw, hey, look, there are also genetic factors. And I met Peter Driscoll who had there his rats, high avoidance and low avoidance rats. We meet them again. They were selectively bred for this behavior. And during rewarding brain stimulation, they behaved quite differently. We don't know why, but that was my first foray into behavior genetics. But of course, Postdocs have to move. And so I went then to Lausanne, to the Institute of the former van der Laws, and came into the world of mice, whiskers. And the first thing I wanted to know is how do the mice perceive the world? And there is a very simple way to do this. You look at the brains of humans 
and of mice from the bottom side. And you see immediately when you look at the dimension of the uh, uh, cranial nerves that the olfactory tract are gigantic, the optic nerves minuscule, and the trigeminal nerve is again very big, very large. And in humans, it's just the opposite. And that means the sensory world of mice is very different. It's kind of an olfactorama and imaging that your whiskers go farther than your hand. How can you move around this way? But it's always dim in uh, this sort of lab environment. And what uh, Hendrik van der Loos wanted to know how the mice used their vibrissa. And so I was suddenly back developing testing devices, learning programming, and we had this final <coughs> uh, specimen, which is called the mausoleum. What I learned from this is that it is easy to train mice for a couple of tasks, but the problem is that you have to quantify the errors and understand why and when they don't perform perfectly. So this is the key, the key for the analysis is the quantification of errors. Now, there happened something in Lausanne. Herbert Schwegler came and I was lured into the domain of the hippocampus. And uh, this happens as follows. Herbert was studying genetic variation of mice in shuttle boxes and was sent to Lausanne to study spines of on hippocampal cells. And counting spines is an awful task if you work in neuroanatomy. And so I was looking for something easier to measure and found that in the hippocampus of mice, there was a projection called Mossy fiber projection on the apical dendrites and a part on the basal dendrites. And is this part the infrapyramidal Mossy fiber that showed big variation between the strains? So uh, we started then with Wim Crucio, many others, a very long cooperation. But to be honest, I must say, perhaps I should have concentrated more on the motor side and studying how the hypothalamus was controlling behavior in the brainstem, following the lead of Steve Krillner, whom you probably know. But whatever, we had a good time in Mahan, got a lot of publications in science, Journal of Neuroscience. And uh, you see, there are beautiful strain correlations and I don't show them all. This is just one example. It was well accepted by the time because it was in the trend that the hippocampus was a cognitive machinery did cognitive mapping. And so it fitted to that what people were believing. On the other hand, it was in a way also leaving then to questions that we will touch later. After a detour to Boston, I came then back to Zurich to build up a phenotyping laboratory with a bright young medical doctor who followed me for a very, very long time. And we share a lot of experiences. You know him well, it's David Wolfer. And so we started an extensive behavioral screening of mutant mice, because before that behavioral scientists were working with rats and only we had the tools and the knowledge to deal with mice. And uh, at that time, uh, we were of course a center of excellence as any other behavioral lab. 
nowadays, but being then a center of excellence was easy because we were the first ones and had no competition. I just go through the usual battery of tests we had built up in the time, neurological scoring, social behavior, lateralization. And for those who deal with condition taste aversion or they should consider doing it, it's a very useful task. And here, the usual stuff, null omises, open fields, emergent tests, whatever you want, we had it. And here, and thanks to David, we succeeded then in largely automated testing or semi-automated testing. And then basically, when we looked overall, we were, with our corporations, pretty successful. You see a lot of natures and science paper because the, uh, the molecular biologists we were working with them were pretty good. But somehow we never realized how this translates into behavior. For example, look at this paper. It has been cited 2000 times since, and still we don't know what the prion protein is doing naturally in the brain, or it's at least a matter of debate. And so it was with many of these uh, results, there were some knacking doubts. So we realized that people had wrong ideas. And uh, we found then, I show this, some strange finding with mostly fiber variations. And generally, we started thinking what we were measuring effectively with these tests. And <clears throat> let us go take one thing after the other. First, and this has been formulated first by David, it's a nice slides. I extended it a little bit. We have these logical fallacies in interpreting behavioral phenotypes of mice. And this goes as follows. There is human anxiety or fear. If you take the volume diazepam, it reduces it. So you feed it to rodents and see that change activity on a rate, also on elevated mazes. And the shortcut, the logical shortcut is that, okay, uh, behavior on elevated mazes tells us something about mouse anxiety, which may or may not be the case. Same for the hippocampus. If you miss it as a human, you have a lot of memory problems. So the hippocampus must be the structure governing memory. And if you destroy the hippocampus in the rodents, they don't find the platform in the water maze. Therefore, water maze learning is a proxy for hippocampal function. And uh, the second problem with that was that, uh, let's just take the water maze. Uh, most of the the molecular biologist and other lay people uh, grasp the concept of spatial memory very well. Okay, the mice find it. So this is proof that uh, 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 a spatial memory must exist. But measuring spatial memory is a very different thing. And they didn't realize that usually in knockout mice, one third to about half of the mice were showing completely normal phenotypes, but statistically it was different. So it was what they expected and we served them, I guess, well. Okay. The next problem was, there are some problems in interpreting the data. Most people who interfere place lesions or inactivate the gene, tend to link a behavioral deficit directly to the removed part or inactivated portion. 
But the reality is, of course, that in most cases, it's the remaining genome, the remaining brain, which is responsible for the variations in the water maze. But if you tell some, let's say, uh, a guy who comes and wants to have his mice tested, that maybe it's your procedure that changed the behavior but could also be perhaps stochastic events we cannot predict. And usually this message is then not so much appreciated. So you know the situation, I guess, pretty well. So let's go to a further point. So what are we measuring in standard tests? And the factor analysis you see here was done, I think, a long time ago by David Wolfer, and you see that the factor number one, which determines the behavior of the mice in the water mice is wall hooking, tigmotaxis, very strong, explains a lot of variability, whereas mice that have problems or let's say problems in finding the platform can occur in mice that can learn this normally, but it's a rare event. And basically it explains not much of that variability. And I think Taffy told me that uh, he has now arrived at more than 9,500 mice in the water mice. But when I try to summarize or to look at all the strains we made, then we found 93 mutant line with stigmotaxis and only two with a selective spatial memory deficit. And that, of course, raises the question, can 93 different genes or treatments act identically on tigmotaxis? Something was strange, of course. For the uh, clients, so to speak, they were happy to see something in the water maze. But if you see time and time again, so, uh, the same differences, there is something to think about. We also continue to study the mossy fiber variations and these findings were not appreciated by the hippocampal community because we found, for example, that mice that have a very strong preference to use one, the left or the right paw, had extended mossy fiber projections, whereas the other ones that used left and right alternatively had low projections. But what has handedness to seek in a cognitive structure? So uh, publishing these things was only possible, let's say, in a little bit marginal journals. And Wim Crucio started to check aggressive behavior, attack latency, and he found that uh, mice that have long projections were slow in attacking compa also companions or other male mice. And this one, they had basically, uh, were at a short trigger and attacked very rapidly. And again, there was a relatively nice strain correlation, but these findings were not really well received because again, what has the hippocampus to do with mouse aggressive behavior? And after all these questions, we decided, okay, we must somehow find someone who can judge what we are doing. And it, it, we try to find a final arbiter, and that is modern nature, so to speak. And we moved to Russia for three purposes. We wanted to have some of our mutants indoors that we knew indoors to have them to test them outdoors. We wanted to see how hippocampal lesions were affecting the mice in outdoor situations. And we wanted to know whether natural selection would 
recognize mossy fiber variations. And so that would be the questions we asked. Would there be, uh, would, would some gain or loss of function mutations be differentially selected? How would the hippocampus do in a natural environment or naturalistic environment? And that was particularly for me where the small variations with the mossy fibers we had observed were they a laboratory artifact or real? Because being forced to retire papers after 20 years, that would be a little bit nasty. So our question was then, if there is rapid co-selection of hippocampal and behavioral traits, then these uh, uh, variations were probably uh, quite effective in controlling behavior. But okay, this is where we went. Unfortunately, it's now no longer possible. You know the situation, 400 kilometers south of St. Petersburg, 400 kilometers west on a station where they were <coughs> feralizing young bear cubs. And we were allowed to build up a complete field station. And it took a long time. I'll show only the very few slides. So we built an animal house and a laboratory. You see it here. I think Wotele was once there and moved a lot of material from Zurich. Built up the first outdoor pens. Most people were working and other some people watch, but uh, perhaps you know Inga Politaeva, Marina Pleskacheva, they were helping us. And we had a nice little field laboratory with cryostats where we could <coughs> study the brains. And these are the outdoor pens in summer. You see, where a couple eight of them all together and in winter. And it was amazing how the laboratory mice adapted to these sometimes rather harsh conditions. So next thing I will show you two slides of mice that uh, of genetically modified mice that had mostly gain of function mutations, more of interest to us. Ah no, sorry, sorry, I forgot this one. And I show you here how mice were released and it's instructive to watch their behavior during release and after some time. So, okay, the mice ready for release, glasnost. So Glasnost. this was glasnost for mice. And you see here, a bunch of mice that was sent from Zurich. I don't recall now exactly which one, but they were not happy with glasnost. You see, they had to be pushed. They were not moving at all. Probably they were afraid. We don't know whether they were just passive, but so they have to be nudged into liberty. Then we tried to have kind of a radial maze set up. And you see here, that is a feeder box. And the mice were wearing transponders, which is the usual now today. And basically they had to visit these boxes over quite a bit of distance. And you see these were about eight meters or 10 meters they had to cross under the wood because of predators. And now you see the mouse arrived duck reluctant and then it jumps and moves, jumps and moves. So the behavior has completely changed. <coughs> Their motor patterns were totally altered. But now for some of the results, you see here that we, there was kind, <coughs> kind of a, mutation, which was 
a good example, a role model for humans, because these knockout mice, they were lean, not fat. They were actively running all the time, good joggers, and they lived 30% longer than normal mice. So that should be good biological fitness. And <coughs> but when we released them, you know, in 2008, after that, we saw that the mutants had practically disappeared. They were genetically equal proportion of alleles, but the wild types dominated. And the follow-up studies in Italy showed then that the animals or that this mutation impaired also lipid metabolism in the mutants and impaired maternal care. And these are, of course, very negative factors for mice living in naturalistic environment during summer and during winter. Here is another one of these smart mice, Shige Itoharas. This glial protein, this glial protein enhances spatial memory in the Morris motor mice and enhanced fear memory, as you see here. And uh, so they also should be good candidates to show their talents in the wild. But in the end, maybe it protected them a little bit. Lots of mice were lost, but the bunch of heterozygous animals here indicates that there may be a small thing, but certainly they did not behave much better than other mice. <coughs> Now back to the water mice and the hippocampal lesions. You see the people involved here, Alexei Vysotsky, Robert Dinkin, Chuck Modelomo, Mike Galsworthy, the late Nada Ben Abdallah, and David. And David tested the mice first in Zurich. And then that was a heroic thing. They were transferred to Russia. But first, the water mice testing. And this was a nice graph, graph by him. And you see <coughs> fully lesioned mice after 10 days. The controls learn the water mice task very rapidly. And when you change the platform, they have a small break, but then they relearn the task very quickly, whereas the mutants were, as expected, basically unable to learn the task. And the so-called probe trial, when the animals had to search over the uh, uh, lost platform position, showed this was only mastered by the controls. But situation changed a couple of months later. And you see now that the both lines learned. They were a little bit slower, perhaps. And the interesting thing was they were slower because they were showed a bit stigmotaxic wall hugging, but otherwise the learning curve is not bad for mice. The very surprising finding was that they seem to have an intact spatial memory. They were as good as searching over the platform position as the control animals, but was the real weakness was they were unable to do a reversal learning. And this is a very strong message. So effectively, when the hippocampus is gone, you are no longer, or if you are a mouse, you have lost your ability to do a reversal learning so it's behavioral flexibility after all. But <coughs> they were then brought to Russia, was kind of a complicated uh, procedure. But in Russia, we had to train them first to deal with the feeder boxes. And to this end, look at these very simple, 
very fast hippocampal test. And this was done by Mike Galsworthy. And you see. Mm -hmm. And now that they've had five to 10 minutes. The mice were placed in the barrel. We'll lift the stones and the mice 40 have access. Mice, 20 hippocampus, 20 controls. And we just simply counted the number of mice that were entering the feeding boxes through these tubes. And after 20 mice, we stopped it. And we did then another test in which we also placed a diaphragm in front of the end. And we found again the same thing. The hippocampus were extremely hesitant in entering these tubes. And even when they knew that there was food inside, when we added the diaphragm, again, they didn't want to enter the tubes. So this was probably, or you can tell me if you know another test that can discriminate 40 mice according to the treatment in let's say roughly one hour. I'm not aware of it but maybe David or Wotele like to learn that. Now, we also had the foot burrowing test of Rob Deacon. <clears throat> and you see, uh, when you fill a tube with my, uh, Julie, sorry. When you fill a tube with morsels, foot pieces, normal C57 mice start kind of a frenzy in moving out that stuff. Nobody knows what triggers this frenzy, but it's very clear that all the hippocampals were unable, did never start to moving out these pieces, the foot pellets, whereas uh, we had in, uh, in a cage with controls, you see there were practically no foot pellets left and they were sleeping inside the tube. So, Again, something that would never been predicted by the uh, neuropsychologists thinking that the hippocampus was the home of uh, cognition. And why does a, uh, and so our question was then, okay, it, this is already strange, but let us take them outside into a pen which was covered by net against avian predators and in which also there were two shelters and these food boxes for <laughs> that would provide food for transponder tagged mice. Inside the view of the shelter, and this is how the mouse looks or the perspective of the mouse. And, but, despite all the pre-training we made, it was a kind of a sad observation that after two days, half of the hippocampals were lost. The other ones, they adapted. And over about 40 days, we had only lost contact, electronic contact with two of them. We assumed they died. And the, also it's the same rate as the controls. They showed also daily feeder visits. And you see that they obviously learned to patrol some of the boxes, but the hippocampus were hyperactive. So they made a lot of unnecessary visit with many double and triple entries. And this is also something you observe in the laboratory. What was interesting was that the hippocampus showed disturbed circadian activity. The controls, as many other mice that we had observed in the field station, showed a rapidly increasing peak of activity, then a decrease, maybe a small uh, increase again, and were then uh, stopping activity. The hippocampus became active very quickly and were then overactive during the entire night. So the conclusion from this study were 
that the hippocampal lesion profile obviously is much more complex than expected by us and probably also by expected by others. Because remember, these animals survived transport from Zurich and a lot of other manipulations pretty well, but disappeared or half of them after two days. So there must be something we did not see and cannot see. And they were, they didn't like to enter the doors. Something we also did not expect. Why should a hippocampal lesion mouse hesitate entering a tube or a little door? What we clearly saw was they lost the ability to perform species specific behaviors. On the other hand, they were hyper reactive, sorry. They were hyper reactive, showed still a rudimentary spatial reference memory, lots of stereotypies, and had this problem in circadian patterning, which you would not really expect if you remove a cognitive structure. And just to take a note of you who are interested in other functions, Richard Lathy had always has very interesting ideas. And just recently, he has reported that the mouse hippocampus contains receptors for at least 250 endogenously circulating proteins and uh, hormones in the body. And uh, this is just in parentheses. If you uh, castrate mice, they will also change their hippocampal mossy fibers quite a bit. But that brings us to the mossy fibers. And we see a, a very costly, very long experiment with very nice results. We brought the mosque out to Russia, out of, we crossed two mouse lines with big mossy fiber projections with two mouse lines with small ones. This was the average. And then we released, found the generations, one in a laboratory in Moscow where they were bred continuously and the other one went into the pen, orange and red. And we took them every year, we took out a sample of some 60 mice, perfused them and studied the mossy fibers and you see that already in the second year, there was quite a differentiation between the wild born and the laboratory born animals that persisted. Now you could ask, argue, okay, these are just reflex and adaptation to the environment. But it was more than this, because you see here that the second year we took out a bunch of mice and brought them back to the lab in Moscow, where they were bred for a couple of more generations, still maintaining the same neuronal or the brain phenotype in the hippocampus. And then we made an embryo, we brought them to Zurich, made an embryo transfer, and still the hippocampal phenotype remained the same. So, quite an intriguing result because it added to the insight we were obtaining there. The first thing is that natural selection of mutants is a powerful judge to assess whether what has been changed in their genes and the brain is biologically important or not. Just for example, in parentheses, the animals, the prion knockouts we had, were surviving pretty well for two years, and then all the mice disappeared. So the prion protein itself is not really, is functionally not, not specifically important. We also discovered some properties that were missed in the laboratory and to me, very important was that natural individual variation of brain structures and behavior 
was selected very rapidly in a few years only. Okay, we then saw that basically it is sufficient to use very simple species specific test procedures on surviving of patrolling than bathing the mouse, the mice in the water maze. And the phenotypic differences between the various mouse models emerge despite social interactions and a non controllable environment. So, why going for standardization any longer? And we also saw that you have to study the mice over extended periods of time. And the practical conclusions for mouse testing can be summarized as follows. Bring the field knowledge back to the lab, expand the time of testing, remove the fear anxiety bias, keep away the experimenter, and don't worry about standardization. Okay, it's maybe a hot issue, but that's my opinion. And it's cheaper, it saves main power if you can do simple monitoring. And that and <laughs> led them to the construction of IntelliCage uh, because first we tried to have little mouse rooms at the University of Zurich, but the veterinarians disliked this idea very much. And uh, were not happy with that. And we put then all the mice in one cage. And this was the first Italy cage that went to Finland where the mice were eating all these colored cables. And uh, we had quickly to develop a new one, which I guess you probably know this one. And we tried then to test a few of the observations we made in Russia and place them in the IntelliCage. And lo and behold, during the first four hours, the mice were very reluctant to visit, to, to go to the tubes, like in Russia, exactly the same. Afterwards, they adapted. Then we saw that they had spatial stereotypies, like in the outdoor pens. And uh, this increased a bit, but it's again in line what we could observe. And we observed the spatial stereotypies that I would always go to a specific or preferred corner in uh, very strong double knockout mice and other mutants that had strong behavioral phenotypes. But of course, it was no longer necessary to test all these in the water maze. And I think David was not, not unhappy because of this. In the end, it happened that, as you see here, <coughs> David developed a procedure by which uh, it is possible in the social home cage to discriminate many strains, lesions, and mutations just by spontaneous behavior. That's one of the main facts we learned in Russia. And for the mossy fibers, it was interesting to see Evelina did a very simple experiment. She put a bunch of these Russian, these Russian mouse lines in the cage, gave a nut in a corner, and so that the laboratory born mice, they were very quickly in inspecting it. The others, the outdoor, well, the, the uh, wild born mice were pretty reluctant, but after 24 hours, the situation was reversed. And I go for some other things, but uh, how much do I have time, Botel? Actually, we are pretty close to the end, so it's. Uh... Okay. Five to five to four. So uh, this is basically the conclusions which led us or that led me 
for the need for parallel endophenotyping because that stuff it's saying might think with their feet. And if you look closely, then it's always the same. Mice treated mice move either too fast, too slow, too early, or too late. So we need at least some additional information. And this additional information was, in our case, the EEG analysis, which was developed by neurologists made by Alexei Vysotsky. And I give you just one example, because we didn't know when pigeons were released over the sea, they approached the coastlines, whether they were circling around here because it was visually interesting or whether they became nervous and had some other problems. And you see that this frequency band is not really active during crossing the sea, but becomes very active if they cross villages or specifically interesting objects. So we could confirm that that was really a visually interesting point in the mouse, uh, in the pigeon brain, and the neurologist can in principle used in many different conditions here, even with marmosets. And this is the last example I show. Uh, what the EG recording can detect. A couple of years ago, Andriy Cherninsky, who is still sustaining in Kiev, was testing these three chamber box here. And you know, usually there is then a mouse placed here or a mouse placed here, and the animal has to move around. But what we see is again, this was empty, but the mouse was interested in just one thing. When it approached the doors, you saw that there were big amplitudes in the EEG that were flattened when it moved around. And when it came back to the doors again, then you saw that in principle, the doors do have a significance for mice. I suspect it's because of the vibrisse but we don't know. And with that, I think I will close here because this is a little bit too theoretical. We can discuss this later, but for the time being, I am happy that you have listened so much. And the only thing which I wanted to say, or I can show perhaps later for those who want to see it, that my favorite animal unsurprising for parallel investigation in home case situations are marmosets, which can be monitored automatically by now in Japan. There are uh, transgenic marmosets there and there are uh, with lots of money in the field and there are even forgive me when I say this, in delicates that can be used by rats, by marmosets, so on. So a perfect perspective for comparative translational research. And with that, I really stop and thank you for your attention. I'm always willing for questions, 